Hello again. For the second in this series of physics in the house, I thought I'd talk about the spin cycle of your washing machine, something we're all familiar with, uh, something that works in a very straightforward way, but actually enshrines a great many basic physics principles. So let's learn a little bit of physics. Okay, so let's um, have another look at our spin cycle in our washing machine and see what bits of physics we can work out of it. Um, I think the first thing to think about is probably something we, um, most of us, I guess, would have done as kids. So here I am as a kid, um, and that would be playing conkers. You remember we used to tie them to the end of pieces of string um, and we could do all sorts of stuff with these but all I want to um, uh, really talk about at the moment is just try and think back and imagine uh, the times when you would spin it round and round and round on the end of your piece of string. So that's essentially the picture that we're going to have in mind. And you'll remember when you did that, you would have felt some sort of tug on your hand. You actually had to grip in order to, be able to keep uh, the conker in place. Let go of the string and our conker would have flown off um, and done goodness knows what damage um, elsewhere. But as long as we hung on to it, we would feel some sort of tug on this string as the conker was going round our head. And the conker didn't um, fly off because it too is feeling a force back up that string. It's what's holding it into place. And that actually is just the tension in the piece of string. So it's a fairly straightforward thing. But it relates very closely to what's going on in our washing machine. As our clothes, wet clothes, are cycling round and round and round uh, in the drum, they, just like this conker, a feeling of force that is going outwards. Uh, it's what we uh, physicists would call um, a centripetal force. Sorry, can't spell and talk at the same time. Uh, you might have come across it in the past labelled as a centrifugal force. It's the same physics, even though um, the definition is, is slightly different. And that force, just like with this conquer on the end of the string, is actually trying to fling things outwards. Uh, and in the drama of the washing machine, of course, the clothes are prevented from being flung too far by the steel drum that they're enclosed in, but that drum has holes in, it has perforations. And so what happens is that the fluid, the water, can actually pass through those um, small holes that have been made in the drum, and then they're collected in a, another cylinder around the outside and eventually pumped away. So that's fine as far as it goes. Uh, we haven't actually delved into a lot of physics yet. But if we go back to this example of swinging some mass or other, a conker or whatever it might be around on a piece of string, then actually there's a very, very straightforward uh, equation in physics that we can use to describe what's going on here. Uh, and it describes the force in this string, the tension, if you like, 
uh, as being related to the mass of the object. So that's the mass of our conquer, say. Uh, its speed, and in fact its speed is squared, and we divide it by the radius of its, um, of its motion. So that would be the length of the piece of string, it would be the diameter uh, of the drum in our washing machine. Now we don't need to spend a lot of time on this equation. I'm not going to try and make this into something uh, more complicated than it is. But this relatively simple formula now explains an awful lot of stuff uh, that we not only see in everyday life, um, but actually a lot of stuff we see in the realms of, of physics as well. So for instance, those of you who've been in the passenger seat of a car that's been going round a bend a little bit too fast for your comfort will notice that you too are forced towards the outside of the car, right? So from your passenger seat, you tend to have to uh, use your muscles not um, in order not to bend over towards the door. It's exactly the same process going on here. But we can actually zoom right out now and look at things on a planetary or even a cosmic scale. So let's start with the case of our dear planet Earth here. Um, and as you well know, you can look outside uh, most evenings um, and see the moon, right? Which is orbiting almost circularly uh, around the Earth and it goes around it approximately, not exactly, but approximately 28 days. Uh, and this, believe it or not, is a pretty good analog for our um, conquer going round on a piece of string or the forces from the spin cycle in our washing machine. So this too is going round in um, uh, this orbit. It's being swung round I suppose in, in essence. If there weren't anything tying it to the earth it would actually just fly off into space. There'd be nothing to stop it. But actually it turns out that there is a string of sorts connecting the moon and the earth uh, and that string uh, is derived from the force of gravity. So the gravitational attraction between the earth and the moon is entirely analogous to the um, string that's holding our conquer in place in this example at the top. And the equations are actually very similar. So we're not now talking about a mass on the end of a string, we're talking about uh, the moon going around the earth and our string is in fact gravitational attraction. But the same physics that's embodied in that equation can be used to describe what's going on in this system as well. And of course it's not just the Earth and the Moon, we could think about the Earth going around the Sun, for instance. Exactly the same sort of physics applies to that, and to the Sun in its motion in our Milky Way, um, our home galaxy, which is itself rotating, of course. Uh, all of these things are controlled by these very, very basic principles of physics. Um, we can go to a completely different scale, of course. We can go from the planetary or the cosmic scale uh, and zoom right down. So let's now look from that huge scale. So I'm going to get rid of this piece of amazing artwork uh, and move on to something that's actually very small. So let's look at something the size of an atom. In fact, let's take the very smallest atom there is which is an atom of hydrogen, and in the middle of all atoms, as you may well know from your school days, uh, is a positively charged nucleus. In the case of hydrogen, it's just a single proton. Uh, and for hydrogen, what's associated with our proton is a negatively charged electron. And this, we can think about in a naive way, is orbiting 
the proton in the middle. Now, quantum mechanics has made this a little bit more sophisticated uh, in the context of modern physics, but actually we can learn a huge amount of basic uh, physics about atoms and how they behave uh, from this basic setup. Uh, and in fact, there was a guy um, about a century ago now uh, called Niels Bohr, uh, and Niels Bohr came up with this astonishingly uh, elegant description of how a hydrogen atom works. And he essentially said, uh, he went back to our equation, in fact, uh, and um, if I remind you what it looked like from our previous um, bit of uh, artwork, all he said was that the force here, so this is our piece of string, remember, uh, this is in fact derived from the fact that positives and negatives attract each other. So this little string here is coming from something called the electrostatic force, which I can't I told you I couldn't write and spell at the same same time. So there we are, our electrostatic force. And the elegance of Bohr's approach to this was to say, well, look, you know, the sort of force that is uh, associated with every spinning uh, mass like this, in this case, we can say it must be equal to the electrostatic force. Why equal? Well, because um, our electron isn't collapsing into the positive charge in the middle, nor is it flying off uh, into um, the space between atoms. It's actually being held in this very stable uh, orbit around the, um, around the nucleus. So these two things must be exactly in balance with each other. And out of that came all of our early understanding of how um, um, atoms behave in this context. This is a very early bit of um, atomic scale physics. All right? And in fact, believe it or not, although this was before quantum mechanics in its full glory, uh, the work that Bohr did actually opened up the way uh, towards quantum mechanics. Uh, it bridged the dam, as it were, and he actually introduced in his work, the very first quantum numbers uh, that we now take for granted as, as physicists. So there we are, everything from the scale of an atom all the way through to planetary and in fact cosmic scales are one simple, beautiful piece of physics actually pertains across all those length scales. So the next time you look at uh, your washing machine when it's doing the spin, um, just think about that. The same physics that is throwing the water out of your washing is the physics that controls the behaviour of um, atoms and the behaviour of planetary systems and in fact even solar systems out on the bigger scale. So look at your spin cycle in a slightly different way next time. It's actually trying to tell you a little bit about uh, how physics is able to explain all sorts of things uh, in the world around us. So until next time, that's it. Enjoy your next spin cycle. Bye.